We're going to jump right into our teaching today because we're still in the, the gospel of Ezekiel, as I call it, and uh, we are today going to be talking about the Valley of Dry Bones, the Valley of Dry Bones, exploring some, some, um, some insights related to this. I think you're going to find very interesting and very encouraging. So let's dive into this and begin with our blessing for the study of Torah, the gospel of Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Amen. In our portion of Ezekiel that we have today, it comes from chapter 37. And this begins the time in Ezekiel Really, in chapter 36, uh, we'll, come, we'll come to that later on. But chapter 37 is part of this time frame in which Ezekiel is giving encouragement to Israel. He's talked a lot, and Ezekiel is kind of, you know, insightful, yes, depressing, uh, yes. Uh, but now he's giving some encouragement, you know, and it's it's like we read, you know, this is a Shabbat of comfort. We read in the Haftarah where, you know, we've had three weeks. We've just come out of three weeks of of mourning. And, and the, the, the Haftarot for the three weeks really kind of pointing out our problems. But what you may or may not know is that now for the next seven weeks leading up to Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is going to be giving us prophets of promise. Hashem always does double plus when he, he rebukes you, but then he gives you seven, you know, three weeks of rebuke, seven weeks of encouragement because God's goal for us is to be revitalized. His goal for us is to be strengthened and be encouraged. Look at, look at the story we just read from the, from the, from the uh, Besorot, Besorah this morning where Yeshua is, goes and finds this man by the pool, asks him if he wants to be healed. The man says, I, I want to, but there's, I can't get into the water. Now, understand, he's an invalid, so he's going to need help to get him in the water. How did the man get there on his mat? He would have been carried there, which would have included carrying the mat. And so he tells him, just get up, be healed. With a word he spoke, with a word, just get up, be healed. Take up your mat and go home. Why take up your mat? Some say here, we read the story, there were some thought he was breaking the Torah, but he wasn't breaking the Torah. For those who believe in the concept of not carrying, it's okay to carry in an Arab. And to this very day, all of Jerusalem is an Arab. There have, evidently there were Pharisees who had a, a more stringent approach. That was very common in ancient Jerusalem. There was a particular sect of Jews in Jerusalem who were very, very stringent. And to this very day, that's the same. Just because somebody is stringent, they'll say you're breaking the law, but you're not really breaking the law. One time, Rebetzin and I were in Jerusalem, and we were eating at a kosher restaurant, which all the, all the restaurants in the old city, this was in the old city of Jerusalem, they're all kosher. They have a big, big thing in the window. It's all in Hebrew, of course, but it says kosher. Kosher lehem hadrim. So we're there eating. We're having a beautiful, wonderful, amazing shawarma pita. The Ruach HaKodesh has already fallen upon me. I'm eating the pita. It's amazing. But seriously, we're sitting there eating, and these two Hasidic young men, very zealous men, came over there like they're mission impossible. They run over there and sit down next to us. Well, I'm like, what are you doing sitting next to me? I mean, just run over there. It's like, <laughs> and he says, this place isn't really kosher. The chief rabbi of Israel doesn't really think it's kosher. 
This is not our first time in Jerusalem. We've eaten in this place many times. And then as soon as they said that, they got up and ran off. Come to find out, this is just a particular sect that doesn't particularly like the rabbi who certified that particular restaurant. And so they're going around. They have a higher standard of some kind. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, whatever the standard was, it was higher. And they were trying to suppress the kosher status of this rabbi. That restaurant is still there today, still is kosher. We still eat there. So you see, it is Lashon the route, but you see the point I'm trying to make here is the Messiah wasn't breaking Torah. Indeed, when he found the man later in the temple, what did he say to him? He said, you better stop sinning or you'll get worse off than you were before. What does it mean to sin? To break the law of Moshe, to break the law of Moses. He's tell, in this case, he's telling the man, the reason you were, you were so sick is because you were violating the law of Moses, and I'm telling you, you better not do that anymore. C- complete opposite message that a lot of people believe today. So here we have in this story, the Valley of Dry Bones, Hashem has been rebuking Israel, and Israel right now is in exile. They're scattered. They're, the temple has been destroyed. The life force of Israel, has, which is the Shekinah, has gone. And they, the, those who are alive feel like dry bones. They feel like, is, I've made a big mistake. I've made a, we've made a mess of everything. Is there any life? In us, or are we just lost? And so here, Hashem is prophesying through the prophet to be sure and tell Israel that even if you're like a valley of dry bones, scattered bones no less, dried out, we've all seen, probably all of us have seen bones, whether they're animal or what have you, that are just dry. We have a we call it bone dry, right? Now, there are, just for complete clarity, there are some in, in amongst the Jewish writers who believe that this incident was a parable. It was a, it was a prophetic vision. It didn't literally occur, but it was more of a prophetic vision. There are others, however, who believe that it was literal, and we're going to come to that, that literal point. But there is just, I was just to put it out there, there is a debate whether this actually literally happened or whether it was prophetic. It doesn't really change the meaning. It, it's just a nuance of the story. But let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37 and see what, <clears throat> what's going on here. Because regardless of what I just said, there are some valuable lessons to be learned here. Ezekiel chapter 37, famous be famously begins, we sang a song about it today. Upon me was the hand of Adonai. It took me out by the spirit of Hashem and set me down in the valley. Now it was full of bones. He led me all around and behold, they were very abundant upon the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. Then he said to me, Ben Adam, can these bones live? And I said, my, my Lord, Hashem Elohim, you know. He said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of Hashem. Thus says my Lord, Hashem Elohim, to these bones, behold, I bring spirit into you, and you shall live. I shall put sinew upon. Now, now I want you to pay attention. We're going to read a, an excerpt of, about this, but I want you to pay attention to the order here just for a moment because it's important. Behold, I bring a spirit into you, and you shall live. I shall put sinew upon you and bring flesh upon you and draw skin upon you, Then I shall put spirit in you. Notice how there is a spirit before and then a spirit after. And you shall live and you shall know that I am Adonai. And I prophesied as I had been commanded. 
And there was a noise while I prophesied, and behold, a rattling, and the bones drew near. See, po- the point here is, is that not only were these just skeletal remains, but they had been there so long that through the course of time, wind and so forth had scattered the bones of a person all around the valley. And so when he began to prophesy, these bones started to, to sh- scatter, or it's not scatter, but rattle and come together and find their person. See, this is the, the, the point being made here as God is saying to the people, it doesn't even matter if your bones are scattered. I have the power to bring your bones from the four winds of the earth and bring them together wherever you are. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but one of the reasons why this is so important is because some of the philosophers said, if you don't die and therefore you're not buried in the land of Israel, then you will not experience the resurrection of the dead. You have to be buried in Israel in order to experience the resurrection. And God is saying to the prophet, I don't care if you're in a distant valley outside the land of Israel, if you have Amunah and me and you put your hope in me, wherever you are, I'll cause your bones to be to come back together. He says here, I, I will... Uh, I shall, and you shall know. So when you see this, you, you will live and you shall know that I am Adonai. So he says, as I prophesied, as I've been commanded, and there was a noise while I prophesied, and behold, the rattling of the bones drew near, bone to matching bone. Then I looked and behold, sinew were upon them and flesh came upon them and skin had been drawn over them, but the spirit was not in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the spirit, prophesy, Ben Adam. And he said to the spirit, thus says my Lord, Hashem Elohim, from the four directions, come, O spirit, and blow into these slain ones that they may live. I prophesied as I had been commanded. The spirit entered into them. They lived. They stood upon their feet, a very, very vast multitude. See, I, I, you know, it's, it's so interesting because I'm not necessarily following, when we're going through Ezekiel, we're not necessarily following, as you, as you figured out, chapters in order. I'm just kind of following a, a, some themes. And I think that Hashem is speaking to us this morning about our movement and saying that this is happening now. This is what's being said to us now. Verse 11 says, and he said to me, Ben Adam, these bones, they are the whole family of Israel. Say the whole family of Israel. It says, Kol Beit Israel. Say it one more time, Israel. Now, see, this is the point. Does it say in Goyim? You know, there are those, I wrote a book called The Noahide Deception. You really need to read it. If you haven't read it, you need to read it because not only does it, does it completely destroy the Noahide deception that's out there, this Noahide idea, but it subsequently also will destroy the Paulinian idea as well. But see, the reality is, is that you have, don't let anybody sell you a bill of goods. There's people out there that have been told either through the Noahide thing or through the Messianic Gentile thing, that you don't have to keep the law of Moses, that you have a share in the world to come. Mm -hmm. Give me some money and I will sell you some property. How many of you, if if I told you that I was going to sell you some property for an exorbitant, let's just call it a five-figure or a six-figure, let's call it six-figure. I'm going to sell you some property at a six-figure value. How many of you would buy that property sight unseen? Raise your hand. I have some, give me, give me, give me some, a six-figure number, and I will give you a share in the United States. Now, some of you be like, you would want to know where. Because there are some places in the United States that may not be the share you want. I asked somebody recently, just this week, who's pushing this narrative. I said, can you, providing sources, of course, tell me exactly and precisely what is the share that these Noahides get? 
What exactly is that? Wouldn't you like to know? As a Jew, I know precisely what my share is. I know exactly what it is. I don't have to ask. It's called Ganadin. It's called the kingdom of God. It's called the throne of God. It's called shade under the, under, under the fig tree. My wife doesn't want to live with me, but she wants to live nearby. <laughs> But seriously, you know, we know as Jews, we know, and, we, and we, as Jews, we know there is a resurrection of the dead. Are you aware that if you ask a rabbi, is there a resurrection for Noahides? You're not going to get a, oh, absolutely. It's like, mm-hmm. and the answer basically is no, there isn't. That's awkward. How, how many of you want to say, okay, let's just say that there are some rabbis out there. Oh, yes, there is. Well, where's the source? Where's the source? Well, I think there might be. Who, who wants to sign up for the I think there might be plan? Who wants that PPO? I want to sign up for the I think I might be resurrected and I get a share in the world to come, whatever that means. Who wants to sign up for that plan? And by the way, it costs just as much. But I want you to notice he says, these bones are the whole family of Israel. What I'm trying to point out here is that the promise that was being spoken here is to Israel in no sir, no ma'am. If you're a Gentile and you haven't gone through conversion, you're not Israel. I'm sorry. You're not. You can be. You can be. If, if you choose to go through conversion, but no, you don't get to put on the Israel name tag just because you decided you woke up one day and you think you is. It says, they say, that who says? Israel says, they say our bones have dried and our hope is lost. We are doomed. That's what Israel is saying, and, and that's what God is, that's the the the, the Israel is saying we've, we've, we've made wrong choices, we've made bad choices, we've lost our hope, we've lost our salvation, we're doomed. Therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord Hashem Elohim. He's being very emphatic here. Behold, I open, say I, I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I I shall bring you to the soil of Israel. Then, then you shall know that I am Adonai when I open your graves and when I raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I shall put my spirit into you and you shall live and I shall set you on the soil and you shall know that I am Adonai, have spoken and done the word of Adonai. He's speaking to Israel. Incidentally, let me throw this out there, by the way, just as a little something, something. There are those out there who say, no, the uh, Messianic Gentile thing is like the Noahide thing. Are you aware that Paul taught that in order for a Gentile to be born again and saved and therefore resurrected a new life, he had to put his faith in the Messiah? Is that do you, in faith in Christ? Do you? Yes. Nod your head, yes. So in order to get born in it again, it you would have to put your faith in Christ, and that's how you're going to receive the resurrection. Is that not true? Yes. Take care yes. Are you aware that a Noahide doesn't even have to have faith? You should read my book. In, in, in the Noahide ideal, all you have to do is not, not do idolatry. But you're not required to have faith in Hashem. So therefore, how is, how is Paul's doctrine like being a Noahide? And by the way, you, people say a, a, a Gentile does not have to convert to be saved. That's what they would say. So they would say that we're wrong saying that as a Gentile you need to be saved. That's, which, by the way, going through conversion is, is literally where the term born again came from. So if Yeshua didn't believe in being born again through conversion, then why was he teaching it? But put that aside for a second because sometimes facts don't matter to people. 
But let me ask you a question. This is logic. They say, in order for a Gentile to be saved, he or she does not need to be converted. Really? What do you call it when a Gentile ceases to be a pagan and becomes a Christian? Is that a conversion? Would you agree with me that a Gentile who was not a Noahide and then became a Noahide converted from not being a Noahide to being a Noahide? And therefore, they get that, that magical <laughs> hidden behind the curtain. You got to guess what it is. We'll tell you after the show's over. The share in the world to come. So in actual fact, what I'm trying to say is conversion is required. Right? So that blows up the whole conversion isn't required argument because, in fact, it is. Because if you're a Hindi, Hindu or you're a Krishna or you're a Buddhist, you have to convert to become a Noahide in order to be saved. Mahdi Yahu, is anything I've said right now confusing you? Or is it confused? Not you. Not you. I don't mean, I shouldn't, let me rephrase. Is anything I've just said confusing? Okay, thank you. That's what I meant to say. I wasn't, I wasn't implicating you at all. I'm just saying. I'm checking myself to make sure that I'm not crazy. So pardon me for mis, misstating that. So he goes on to say, He's going to open up our graves. He'll, and he says in verse 14, I shall put my spirit into you and you shall live. And I shall set you on your soil and you shall know that I'm Hashem, have spoken and done the words of Adonai. Now, that's, that's the first part of chapter 37. We're going to get into the second part of chapter 37, Bezrat Hashem, next week when we talk about the two sticks coming together. And we're going to clear up a whole lot of mess on that one. Woo, that's going to be clean up on aisle six. We're going to fix that. But let's go back to this concept of who these dry bones are to begin with, okay? Now, first of all, there's lots, there's there's a few different opinions but we're going to go with the number one opinion, the, the, the most solid opinion, presuming that this, is, this event actually occurred, okay? First of all, I want to mention something here that we talked about this last week. We'll come, we'll come back to that in a second. Let's deal with this first thing. Let me, I want to get ahead of myself. This valley of dry bones is said to have been a large group of people from the tribe of Ephraim. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to mark the time because what I'm about to share with you is something from the depths of my heart that you need to share with your Hebrew roots friends who, A, think they're Ephraim, they're not, and B, they are hell-bent, and I emphasize hell-bent, on creating a new calendar for some reason. You know why the re- what the reason is? Go back to hell-bent, okay? But they're real big on this, this calendar cr- craziness. They think they're Ephraim, and they want to create a new calendar. Listen to this, Okay? So these are a bunch of Ephraimites who, while they were in Egypt, according to Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, chapter 48, a man named Ganon, who was a descendant of Ephraim, claimed to have been sent by God to take the Jews out of Egypt. His tribesmen were the only ones who followed him. They calculated their own calendar, and they were 30 years too early. Oh, they did all the calculations. They had people looking at the grain and looking at the moon and doing all this ooby jooby moving all the things back and forth. You didn't know that the tribe of Ephraim was the ones who originally founded Norway. They did not. just kidding about that. They didn't do it. 
They did all their calculations, and of course, the Judah was wrong, naturally. We're always wrong, which is how you know about the Torah, because we're so wrong, we kept it, now you found it, now we're wrong. All right. Anyway, and so they left Egypt 30 years early because they developed their own calendar. And what happened? God wasn't with them. <laughs> Interesting. And they went to the way, they went the short route. They went the short route on the short bus from e Egypt to the Holy Land, which takes them through Felicia. And they all got killed. And their bones lay in this valley. And by the time Ezekiel shows up, they've been there for a long time. Nevertheless, God in his mercy resurrected these bones. So these bones were the tribe of Ephraim. And now listen to this. It says in another insight, they lack the life force which comes by keeping God's commandments. What's another what is another characteristic of Ephraim is that they rebel against the commandments of God. So listen, ladies and gentlemen, so to the Hebrew Roots people out there, we love you. We want you in this movement as Jews. We need you. We need your kids. We need your, 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 your teenagers. We need your fire. We need your zeal. But not as Gentiles. We need you as Jews. And by the way, if you'll kick Paul and throw him under the bus, you'll be saved. He's the one, he's your problem, but I digress. So listen to the Hebrew rich person who's watching me right now. Because somebody loves you enough to send you this clip. You are not Ephraim. You are not Israel yet. And don't call the spirit of Ephraim on you. Because Ephraim is a deceiving, rebellious, seditious, delusional spirit. And he'll, he'll end up taking you to a valley where you'll end up being slain. Don't do that. You're not, it's being Ephraim, you're not Ephraim, okay? And there's nothing to be proud of if you think you want to be. There was nothing good about the northern kingdom from its inception. You're not one of the lost tribes, okay? So anyway, so that's what's happened here. Now, the other part of the story is, remember last week, I talked about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They, were, they came to Daniel and said, we're not going to bow down on the statue. What should we do? Will God save us? And Daniel said, I don't know. You should go ask the prophet Ezekiel. They're all contemporaries. So they go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel goes and asks God, and God says, I'm not going to help him. Then Ezekiel comes out. He's very mournful. He's weeping. He's crying. And he says, God said he's not going to help you. And the, the boys think about it, and they said, well, all right, we're not going to desecrate God's name anyway, no matter what. So we're going to go, we're not going to bow down anyway. As soon as they walk out the door, God manifests to Ezekiel and says, you didn't think I was going to help him? Now, it's a little bit of a rebuke to Ezekiel. Ezekiel should have known that God was playing, kind of check, check what you're going to do. As a test for Ezekiel, Ezekiel thought, I can't believe God's not going to help him. And he said, you don't think I'm going to help him? Watch, I'm going to help him. And then as soon as they go off, this, this happens on the same day God takes Ezekiel to the valley because obviously Ezekiel needs some remedial training. <laughs> happens same day. While God is causing the fire to not burn the three, indeed, he's in the midst of the fire with them. At the same time, he's also Memtet's over there, and God, the ancient holy one, is over here. Memtet is teaching Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah, and the ancient holy one is giving Ezekiel a lesson. All on the same day. What was a powerful day? In fact, the sources bring down that when they come up out of the fire, 
The, a wind came and caused that nasty idol to fall over, and that wind caused the idol to fall over and bust into a million pieces, and that wind is the wind that came and caused the dry bones to come back to life. Because the wind of Amuna was the wind that brought these dry bones. And it wasn't just Amuna, understand. They wouldn't bow down to the idol. You can't claim to have Amuna and dance around a Christmas tree. You can't claim to have Amuna and pick up eggs. You can't claim to have Amuna and do idolatry. Your Amuna has to be pure. That's why Yeshua said to the man, did you pick up your mat? Yeah, you better not break the Torah anymore. Otherwise, you'll be worse off than you were when I found you. Same thing he said to the woman caught in the adultery. He said, where are your accusers? They've gone, my Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. The reason you were brought here, girl, is because you didn't break the Torah. Now, I forgive you, but don't go out and break the Torah anymore. That's why Yeshua's message was that repent for the kingdom of God is near. His message was a message of action. God said to the, to the prophet Jonah, I'm not going to kill the Ninevites because I see their deeds. Everybody wants to quote John 3.16? Read the whole chapter. After John 3.16, Yeshua talks about deeds five times. He says faith once and deeds five times. Why? Because what we do proves what we, what we say we believe. That's where cognitive dissonance comes in. I talk about cognitive, cognitive dissonance a lot. Cognitive dissonance is a mental disorder. And it means that when you are confronted with the opposite of who you think you are, instead of dealing with that reality, making teshuva and correcting that behavior, you make an excuse for that behavior. Well, I don't believe in stealing. I went to Walmart yesterday and stole a whole bunch of stuff. Instead of dealing with the fact that you're a hypocrite and you need to make the shuva and stop, stop breaking the law, you now blame Walmart. Well, th you know, they're overpriced and stuff, so I deserve it. Or my friend made me do it, you know, right? God, this woman you gave me. <laughs> I st men, you use that to this very day. In fact, the sages teach about this whole situation that in Hebrew, the, the, the phrase for resurrection of the dead is, <clears throat> is techiyat hametim, techiyat hametim, resurrection of the dead. And they, they actually say that the resurrection of the dead, this whole incident was predicated on the mitzvah of Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah because there were lots of Jews who were bowing down. And these three said, no, we're not going to. And God was ready to destroy the world because, see, when Israel gets rid of Torah, this is why it's so important. Israel needs, there's always a remnant, and we need, we, as Jews, we need to hold on to Torah because the world exists because of Torah keeping. The minute that Torah, this is why the Satan, listen to me right now, you wonder why the Satan worked so hard to have a guy write some letters that would try to get Torah wiped off the face of the earth. Why? Because Satan wants God's creation destroyed. And he knows that the key to that destruction is Torah observance. And if he could get the whole world, which includes everybody, to stop keeping Torah, he knows that he would win. And so these three men... Their willingness to die rather than break Torah led to God's promise of the resurrection of the dead. We can thank Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah for it because they were willing to be thrown into a fiery furnace. It's interesting, too, by the way, because in Shir Hashirim Rabbah 714, it actually says that all of this, we talked about, you know, all these things happened at the same time. All of this happened on Yom Kippur. So, you know, I say, you know, we talk about Rosh Hashanah, we talk about Sukkot, we talk about Simchat Torah, Pesach. The most important holiday on the calendar is Yom Kippur. It's the most important one. And, you know, at other places, you're, you're not going to see, 
well, when I say other places, I'm talking about places that believe in the Messiah, supposedly. You're not going to see big crowds on Yom Kippur. They might not even have a Yom Kippur service. But Yom Kippur is the most important holiday. And we see here that it's Yom Kippur celebrates a renewed covenant. It celebrates a resurrection. It celebrates ardent faith. But let's go, let's go on and look at something else that is said here in Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks to Hashem and he says, Hashem says, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel was obviously at a point, and I'm just going to give him a lot of credit because I, I, I can empathize. He just seems, he seems beat down. He seems like between him and Jeremiah and other prophets, their whole life's work is a big failure. And so God says, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel says, only you know. He doesn't even have the immunity to say, of course, Hashem, you can do anything you want. You've created heaven and earth. you created the universe. Of course, you, if you want them to live, they'll live. He doesn't even say that. In fact, in the notes here, it talks about that, that Ezekiel is taken to task about this and says, because you didn't have the faith, because you did not have the faith to say, yes, they can, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to have the privilege of being buried in the Holy Land. So he kind of, he's kind of chastising Ezekiel here a little bit. <clears throat> Nevertheless, God in his mercy made it so that Ezekiel would in fact be the one through whom this miracle of the dry bones would actually come to pass. And there's an interesting insight here I want to mention in the time we have remaining. I'm looking for, oh, it's right here. At this juncture, Ezekiel becomes an, the instrument, the agent of God. And there's an interesting insight in the Talmud in Tanit 2a. Because here, God says to Ezekiel, you prophesy to these bones. You do it. And the, the insight is that the key of, of resurrection is something that belongs only to God. Indeed, there are three keys that belong only to God, and he doesn't, as it says in the Talmud, they are not entrusted to an agent. This is in, in the Tanait 2a. Now, it says in the footnotes, they're not entrusted to an agent, but how can you explain that there were people like Elijah and Elisha who saw people res raised from the dead through their prayers? And the answer is, is well, <clears throat> he can give these keys temporarily to someone for a one-time occurrence, but he doesn't give these keys to them temporarily. That's number one. Number two, he doesn't give these keys all three at the same time to one person except Yeshua. The keys that are mentioned here, there's actually three, and the Talmud adds a fourth. The first three keys are the keys of rain. The second key is the key of resurrection. The third key is the key of childbirth, childbearing. And the fourth key the Talmud brings down in Tana Eat 2a is the key of sustenance. These keys are are only entrusted to God, and he would never give all of them together to one individual because they're solely for Hashem. And yet we read that when it was storming, Yeshua commanded the rain to cease, and they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the rain obey him? When the woman was, had the issue of blood, meaning that she had blood running, she could not get pregnant, she was not in a position of being able to bear a child, he healed her and made her now not only just healed and pure, but now able to have kids. In John chapter 11, he comes to the tomb of his good friend, and the sister says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And he said, he'll live again. And she said, I know, Lord, that in the resurrection of the dead, he'll rise from the grave. He said, that's not what I mean. I am the resurrection and the life. 
And then, of course, we know about the fishes and the loaves. Yeshua had all four keys. Why? Because he's Mimtet. These four keys only belong to Hashem. He is the one who had the ability to raise these bones up from the dead. There's a lot more that we could say about this, but let me just conclude the thoughts today and another lesson that we can learn from, from this dry bones incident. First, the first lesson is that we have hope, that no matter what's going on or no matter what has happened in your life, no matter how dry your bones are, no matter how scattered they are, Hashem has the ability to raise those bones a new life. <clears throat> but I wanted to mention about this spirit coming in. It says here in the Midrash, it says there's a Midrash that talks about Midrash Tankuma Yutro 4 points out an irony here. First of all, it says, hear the voice of the Lord. And the irony is, is that these same words had been spoken to the people when Jeremiah said them in 2.4. He employed, implored them to pay heed. They did not listen but now the dry bones are more receptive to the word of God. Let's, ladies and gentlemen, let's not get to the part, the point rather in our life where we are more receptive to God's word after we're a pile of dry bones laying in a dusty valley. Let, let our ears be attentive to the word of God now while we yet live and declare his name. Because, see, the, the, the psalmist said, can the grave, can the grave praise you? See, these dry bones didn't have the power to praise God, but we do. They're hearing the word of God. That's wonderful. But they didn't listen when they were alive. Also, one final thing he says here, he, he talks about the order. He says, I'm going to bring a spirit into you, and you shall live. I'll put sin you in you, and bring flesh upon you, and draw skin upon you. Then I, you shall, I'll put a spirit in you, and you shall live. And the commentators point out something very interesting here. That the spirit is mentioned, and then it's mentioned about the sinew and the, the flesh and the muscle and so forth. And then the spirit is mentioned again. And they said this is like it was in the, in the tabernacle. When it came time to build a tabernacle, the thing that was mentioned first is the ark and then all the other things. And, and once, but all those other things had to be built before the ark could enter into the temple. So why is the ark mentioned first prior to the, the building itself? It makes sense. Let's talk about the building and then the ark. And the answer is because the ark is what makes the building the building. The ark is the soul and the ark is the Torah. And so what he's saying here is that you, you, we, ladies and gentlemen, are flesh and bone and sinew, but that's not the essence of who we are. As the Rebetzin has taught in her Musar classes, we are not people that have a spirit. We are a spirit that happens to have a body. Our most important effort in life should be to live a spiritual life. This is why God said, I'm going to put a spirit in you and then send you in bone and flesh and so forth and then fill you with my spirit. He wants us to know, he wants us to know that our life is, is bookshelf, bookmarked by the spirit of God. That's why the most important thing to us is keeping Torah. That's why I said, you know, there's people out there, they might have a career that has them working on the Shabbat, and, and that career doesn't involve medicine or saving life or something like that. And you might think, well, what do I do? My career is about working on Shabbat. Change careers. Rabbi, what? It's about spirituality, my friend. If you're in a, and if you're in a job field that just, they just work on Shabbat, and there's nothing you can do about it, change your job field. Well, my kids are in sports, and all the sport games are on, on Shabbat if I ch get them out of it. Oh, you can, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but for me, friend, I, I choose God above anything else. You say, well, that would that'd take a lot of effort. Anything worth anything takes effort. So listen. Let's not be a walking valley of dry bones. Let's invite the Spirit of God to come now. Let's hear his voice now. Let's allow the Spirit to fall upon us now. 
for those Hebrew roots friends of ours out there, stop trying to reinvent the wheel. Stop trying to come up with your own. You say, I don't believe in the Jewish customs. Look, if I spent five minutes with you, I could point out tens of customs, 20 customs, 50 customs that you've created for yourself. All it is is rebellion. All it is 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 anti-Semitism. All it is is a disease in your heart called Paul. And it's time for you, it's time for you to get a heart change. Amen. Thank you, Hashem. Hallelujah.